Welcome to the Brickworks New York Design Studio. My name is Anna Lewanzanis, and I'm the Design Studio Manager here. Whether you are joining in person or virtually, I would like to invite you to our first event of 2022. At Brickworks, our goal is to make beautiful, stylish products that last forever. Products that are innovative, modern, timeless, and durable, as you can see on the display. The studio represents the very best of Brickworks and is a demonstration of our ongoing commitment to the architectural, building, and consumer communities. Our guest speakers here tonight are Paul Anderson and Paul Preisner, whom amongst their many prestigious projects were the commissioners and curators of the Pavilion of the United States at the 17th International Architecture Exhibition at the Venice Biennale. I would like you to give them both a warm welcome to our studio and thank you guys for braving the cold and speaking to us here tonight um, about the execution of the US Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Before we begin, there's just some small housekeeping. The fire exits are on your left and the bathrooms are two on your left. Please welcome the Pauls. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. I'm Paul Preisner. This is Paul Anderson. Hi. Um, I think, you know, before we get started, one thing that we want to do uh, is thank you Brickworks uh, as one of our sponsors uh, for the US Pavilion. We both literally and metaphorically couldn't have done it uh, without their enthusiasm and, and kind of support of the project. So uh, that's what we want to kind of show you about, uh, is the Pavilion of the United States at the 17th International Architecture Biennale. This is the US Pavilion. Uh, usually I kind of start with a little bit of a history. So the Venice Biennale was a, was a a biannual art exhibition, art fair, that began in the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, it was kind of constructed within the public gardens, the Giardini, and, and slowly expanded. In the very first part of the 20th century, nations started producing and building their own permanent structures uh, to house their art within the, the gardens. The Belgian Pavilion was the very first one. The United States uh, started it, or, or kind of constructed their pavilion in the 1930s. Uh, the New York Grand Central Art Galleries commissioned the project, operated the project by New York architects Delano and Aldrich, uh, and it was constructed, here it is. We'll kind of get into it a little bit later uh, as our project kind of relates to it. In the 1980, or in 1980, uh, the Biennale introduced the architecture exhibition to take place in the off years of the art exhibition. Uh, that happened. This is the 17th occurrence of it that, it, that we put on last year. Uh, here's the kind of generalized title. Our project was called American Framing. Um, and I think that kind of, it is both a metaphor uh, in a sense and quite literal uh, in that it's, it's literally wood framing. Uh, Paul and I have been working together on projects, collaborative projects uh, since 2014. When was the first? 13. Yeah. 13? Yeah. Uh, when we put together a project called Two Barns for the Biennales of America in Denver. We had since more or less every year done these kind of collaborative projects. We both maintain our separate uh, independent architecture offices. Uh, Paul's in Denver, mine in Chicago. Uh, but every year we had worked on one or two of these kind of uh, collaborative projects for exhibitions, whether it was the Chicago Architecture Biennale, the Biennale of Americas, uh, or, or kind of open competitions for projects. Um, and, and we had started to notice a theme of our collaborative work where we seemed to kind of identify one particular material type or kind of construction type and explore it or kind of exacerbate its qualities and, and produce a kind of weird thing, whether it was a steel vault uh, that was so thin, it its building permit drawings were you know, represented by a single line that caused the plan reviewers problems, or a big stack of foam bricks in, in Denver. Uh, and the cycle of the US Pavilion application was coming up, and we were just trying to figure out what we might work on next. Uh, and we both at the time had, uh, in our own practices, uh, single family houses that we were working on under construction, kind of in the skeletal frame of wood framing, which you see everywhere and generally never really think about uh, except in passing and, and we were talking and thought that it might seem 
a kind of half smart idea to make a proposition for the US Pavilion at Venice uh, to kind of really investigate this type of construction that's so ubiquitous, uh, it's more or less invisible or disregarded or kind of unheralded, uh, but underscores and maybe kind of uh, supports you know, the, the kind of generalized American landscapes of building. Paul thought that was a smart idea. Uh, and so we kind of did, and we started looking into it uh, for a kind of full year with, with workshops or seminars that we ran at the University of Illinois uh, in Chicago, where we both teach. Um, and the history of it is kind of as follows in an abridged sense. So uh, it is a form of construction out of soft wood, which is a very kind of terrible form of wood uh, for these types of things. The trees grow fast, it splinters, it's a little like irregular, it warps. Uh, it, it originated in the Midwest, Chicago, Minnesota, Michigan, um, largely from immigrants of Europe, Scandinavia, that were coming from traditions that were familiar with these kind of half timbering structures or full timber structures. Uh, but at the same time, we're in this kind of new world uh, that was rapidly expanding population-wise, uh, both with need and with land as it moved west, uh, but also didn't really have full access to the kind of supply of hardwood that produced timber structures, nor was there really uh, the kind of prevalence of skilled labor uh, that would be required to do the kind of heavy timber construction uh, with lots of mortise joints and kind of carving and things like that. But cheap wood was in abundance, and uh, low-skilled labor was in abundance, and a kind of like feral creativity that started to realize that you could produce things without columns as long as you had uh, 20 columns uh, of, of much lesser construction. So you get basically the stud wall, which is kind of in between masonry and uh, you know hardwood in the sense in that you've distributed the load to all of these uh, rather poor forms of construction and it somehow kind of works. With minimal details, with wood that's light enough, you can kind of carry it to the site yourself or you can put it on carts as your family runs west into Nebraska to put a stake on some land with the requirement that you build a house there to acquire ownership of it as, as westward expansion kind of happened. You could build it with low teams. You could build it with your family. Uh, you only needed a few kind of marginal details to become familiar with. And you could start to produce an architecture that typically, you know, at the time, this is again the early 19th century, uh, the 1820s, 1830s, the, the majority of architecture was either masonry, stone, or heavy timber uh, at the time, requiring heavy equipment lots of horses uh, you might not own, uh, and people who knew what they were doing uh, to work with those things. What the Midwest also had was Douglas fir and lots of kind of spruce and soft wood, so it was kind of easy to get, and it built a city. Uh, for example, Chicago, this is the South Lumberyard on the South Chicago River. Um, this is a photograph from early 20th century uh, in Seattle. I think it's a time life photograph just showing kind of the loose lumber stacked up there producing its kind of own you know, architectural object by all of the kind of minimal parts uh, of the project itself. There's a, there's a human. Uh, this is also the lumber works in, or the kind of lumber yards in Chicago along the river. Wood has a downside, it also uh, you know, does this. And Chicago also like built itself and unbuilt itself uh, by its kind of use with, with soft wood in a sense. But it, it kind of began to expand uh, because it was so easy to work with in a sense, because it required such little investment uh, in education of the workers, because you could kind of do it yourself in a way with, with a familiarity with some basic concepts. It also became something that was used for carnival novelties. Uh, this is the Coney Island elephant, which was an actual elephant that was made that you could kind of go up into. There's awful histories of it, uh, the, the kind of slaughter of black union workers uh, in the Bosolga or Boglu, Bogusa uh, sawmills. People moving stuff with trucks. Uh, but again, the basic premise of it, and I guess in a way the promise and why it became so adopted is it was cheap, uh, it was quite simple, 
Uh, you could just kind of put people into it. They didn't need to know much more than how to swing a hammer. Uh, and you didn't even need to be precise with nails because nails were cheap and you would just use a lot of, a lot of them. Uh, you know. So these are the trees that built America, the Douglas fir. And wood frame construction at this point uh, in history starts to account for over 90% of all of the domestic structures in the US. Um, and that's still the case. Sometimes per year as high as 96, 97%, but always over 90% of new construction in the US is soft wood framed. One of the reasons that this was made possible was the, the production of cheap nails. Uh, as before, the, the kind of nails were hand forged. They were, it took a while to make, but mass produced nails uh, produced the assembly system that allowed you to cheaply put together wood frame studs. Uh, as things developed, they got even cheaper and found ways to make use of even worse parts of the wood. Um, so most of the wood gets subsumed into dimensional lumber, uh, but then the remnants of that now get used into OSB, which provides the kind of sheathing that keeps the things up. So one thing about wood framing that is kind of, um, let's say visually uh, unsettling is that everything looks like a mess until it's all done and no wall holds up by itself, but it requires all of them to be put together before there's any kind of structural stability. So the overview of the construction has tons of diagonal bracing, temporary supports. Uh, once every wall's up, it's still not really laterally uh, sound until it has the sheathing on it to keep it together. None of the parts are very good by themselves. When they're all kind of together, they produce a, a reliable house. There's a kind of interesting anecdote that Paul discovered early on, I think was in, in Indiana. Um, there was a house that got uh, lifted off of its foundations during a windstorm, a wood-framed house, um, but it just rolled down the hill uh, intact in ways to kind of like, which settled, settled some nerves, um, I guess, in a sense. Here's the patent drawing for OSB, um, measuring of trees. Uh, and that will just bring us to the kind of particulars of the project. So this is the Giardini um, in Venice, which is the site of the US pavilion. The Giardini is a big public gardens, which is populated uh, by other national pavilions, the British, the French, Russian. The US pavilion is located right there. Here it go. So, um, you know, one of, one of the reasons, like Paul said, that we, that we thought that this might be a, a good topic to present at the Venice Biennale, which is really has people from all over the world coming to present different kinds of ideas and projects of architecture, is that, um, like you said, it's, it accounts for over 90% of construction in the U.S., but in other countries, it's not used very much at all. I mean, most countries have a little bit of it, but it's for sure not the primary uh, way of building. So a lot of people outside of the United States haven't seen it. And um, even people in the U.S. maybe have seen it here and there when they, you know, drive past a construction site, but maybe haven't actually walked through a, a building while it's being framed or something like that. So um, what we did, so these, these are some of the models that we put together for the, for the proposal. And um, what we wanted to do was, was build a full-scale framed structure that was uncovered to, to show what framing looks like and feels like um, to visitors to the exhibition. So um, we proposed this, and I'll get into a little bit more of the, the specific design of it in, in a minute. Um, but it was, you know, to go in front of the, the pavilion, you would see the, 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 you know, original pavilion building, which is a neoclassical building through it. and. Um, and enter the exhibition through it. So then this, this is it as it was, as construction was being completed. You can see here. And, you know, in many ways it looks like a house. You know, it was, it, it, we, we anticipated that it would be somewhat familiar to people. You know, they might recognize like that it has a roof, that it has dormers. Um, you know, that, that then it has an eave in front, which you can see at the bottom of this image. And 
it creates a kind of screen through which you see the, the neoclassical construction of the, the 1930s pavilion building beyond. In, in a way, this is important because uh, the, the contrast between the two, because um, the neoclassical building had aspirations toward European architecture, you know, to try to bring like the best of a Beaux-Arts tradition of design to the United States, whereas the wood, you know, wood frame construction is really a very, very different kind of thing that's more, more work-a-day and ordinary, not especially considered to be exceptional in, in any respect, but it's just kind of the common material of construction today. And so we thought that that contrast was an important one to make. Well, at the same time, we designed it as an addition to the original building in the sense that it, it finishes off the, the, open, the normally open courtyard so that that courtyard is, an, is actually an enclosed space. Um, visitors entered the exhibition like here through, you know, through the wood frame structure and could go up into the, the upper floors of it. Um, and again, it was, it, was, it was intended to look pretty much like a house with a porch and eaves, and, but maybe, but maybe in, uh, an odd version of a house too in the sense that it was like very tall and skinny, the, there, there were more dormers than you usually see, um, and of course it's unfinished. And in going up and through this built full-scale version of it, people would be introduced to the subject without us having to explain what wood framing is. So you, you just go there, you walk through it, you get a feel for it, you start to understand what it's like, and through that experience, you know what it is before you enter the galleries where you'd see some other work on framing. So here you can see about how it was four stories tall and only about 12 feet deep. Twelve feet, the slab actually, I think was a little more than twelve feet. The actual building was a little under three meters, so. And this is the Scandinavian pavilion on the right, and there were, you know, some things like when you when you build things, you don't even you know think about them or anticipate them, and then you start to see certain correspondences, like once it's there, and, and you know, there's like kind of fun, interesting, you know, coincidences. And one of them was this here that the you know the the structure of the of the Sphere Fen pavilion next door is like the rhythm of that just kind of carried across into the framing. There were two sets of furniture. So everything on the exterior of the exhibition, so that was in front and in the courtyard, was built full scale, and everything on the inside is not. So uh, outside, there were, there were two different uh, sets of furniture that were, that were designed by colleagues of ours in Chicago. Um, uh, Kerry Norman and Thomas Kelly designed this furniture, which you, you know, you'll see a few different pieces. This is the rocking chair version of it, and it was shaker furniture that then was built out of just kind of regular dimensional lumber. So, um, but it changed. You know, you, you couldn't, you, they couldn't make it exactly the same because you can't cut a piece of soft wood and a curve. So, like the rocking chair can't rock. It just has a piece that just holds it steady. And actually, a lot of really like there were it's one of the more beautiful moments I think that we remember from the you know from the early days of the pavilion was one of which was a was a mother sitting in the rocking chair with her baby. You know, just sitting there like quietly like on the front porch of a house. It was really nice. So this is that, uh, the rocking chair again. Then they made another just basic kind of a kitchen, you know, sort of like, ta like table chair. And then there, there was a bench. And then, the, you know, and those were located throughout this, this full scale wood structure as a kind of like domestic furniture, which made it feel a little more like a house. And they were positioned on all the floors so people could sit and you know, look out over the, over the Giardini from there. And then moving from, from that into the galleries, there were um, several sets of works that were presented in the gallery. So on the walls were photographs. There, there are four, really, really four rooms with like a kind of rotunda in the middle in, in the building. One side, two of the two of the gallery galleries were we presented work by Chris Strong, who is a uh, commercial photographer who um, took very like kind of straight documentary photos of construction sites and people who work in wood framing. And then we had on tables running through the galleries um, models. They're all all at the same scale, half inch scale models of 
buildings which maybe were important in one way or another to the history of wood framing. So we kind of tell that history through models um, you know, running, running through the show. And then on the other side was some work by an artist named Daniel Shea. And uh, we'll show you, you know, some examples of all of that stuff coming up. But here you can kind of see, like, this was a typical setup for a gallery room to have some models in the middle and uh, you know, photographs on the walls. This is the first gallery, and it starts like, you know, similar to the approach to the whole exhibition, we start with the most familiar, um, recognizable sort of images and examples of wood framing. And as you go through, they become less rec recognizable and a little bit more abstract or um, ethereal or nebulous in terms of like, you know, you can't, you, maybe you don't understand exactly what they are. And that was intentional because this is something that we, you know, wood framing, I think architects, we think we know what it is and how it works, but I think the one point of the exhibition was to try to open that up and, and you know, ask whether or not there are some newer, different ways that we could think about it and use it. So, um, you know, it was intentional for it to go from like what we know to maybe we don't know this as well as we think we do and we can, you know, find some new understandings or interpretations of it. So these two, two uh, models, the one on the left is a, they're both kit homes basically, the one on the left was a 19th century one that was published as a cheap farmhouse was the, was the name of it. And, uh, you know, it came with plans and a list of materials. So if somebody was going out in the prairie, they could use that to build their home. And on the right is a Sears catalog home from the 19 teens. And then, uh, yeah, just a few more examples of that kind of stuff. And then this is just a, a, a few glimpses of Daniel Shea's work, which do you want to talk about that? Or keep going. It's keep going. Spike. So, Daniel's work was, Daniel is an artist, and his work, um, he documented materials and textures and people and animals that are adjacent to wood framing, but not strictly speaking wood framing. So it would be, you know, like here, for example, you could see like the, the bark of a tree, um, you know, a, a, somebody who's working on a construction site, um, you know, you'd, you'll see other examples where It'll be just like the, the leaf patterns, you know, or a, like a bird in the forest. He, he visited the, the places where, where, you know, forests where, where the wood comes from to, you know, to build this way. Um, you know, the places where the wood framing is and things are going on, but, but you know, like tried to, to understand like how, you know, what are, what are all the kind of like pieces of culture and nature that are connected to and kind of create the mythology around wood framing. Um, yeah, and, and at times like the presentation of that could be like that photo is hung very high, you know, in some cases, like the photos were different sizes. This is a, this is a group of models that, you know, another set of models that were a little bit more uh, like example, like examples of kind of alternative architecture, I guess you could say, or the, and for sure, like more exuberant formally. So, on the on this one is on the right is uh, a dome from Drop City, which was a countercultural artist community in from Southwest Colorado. That's that was from like '67 to '72, roughly. Um, the one in the middle is a blockhouse, which is this like military outpost where they that they built on the frontier. It was a building type that lasted a few decades and then was gone. They, they rotated the upper floor so they could see better, survey the land around better, around it better, but also has a dark history like a lot of the rest of wood framing and that it was, uh, you know, those were like military buildings that were used in the, um, in the American Indian Wars. Um, and this is a warehouse um, which may or may not have been probably wasn't the first wood framed building, but um, Siegfried Gideon, the historian in, uh, you know, in, 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 was it Mechanization Takes Command? Or space, time was, space Time and Architecture, I'm sorry. Space Time and Architecture, he, he attributes the, you know, like, the, like George Washington Snow, the guy who built this warehouse, he says that he was, the, he was the inventor of wood framing, although then in a footnote, you know, he, goes right back and retracts that and says, well, he probably wasn't because this was probably a more organic, anonymous kind of invention that took place slowly over time in a grassroots way where people were kind of making little improvements here and there to it. And he, you know, he inherited that from them. But 
this is the first documented individual building, at least, that we could find, where any, uh, the first time anybody says, like, this building was wood framed and it's important for that reason. And it was built on the Chicago River um, in 1832. And, um, and we worked with, I think this is actually really, really important to know that we worked with, with students from UIC on all of this, particularly on the history and the models. So they, they actually researched all of this and tried, you know, and then figured out like which ones do we need to make in order to present this history. And they did all this like forensic research to reconstruct this one. We don't know what it looked like. No, no photos or, or drawings of it um, exist. But knowing the, the, its use, which it was, a, it was a lumber storage facility, and knowing what the building site was and seeing that located on a map, we could, we could, you know, they were able to kind of like put to, and knowing like the construction detailing of the time, how pieces went together, they, they were able to, to, um, you know, reconstruct it and say like this is probably what it looked like, and and, um, but again, with no evidence other than a, you know, like kind of a, a bit of, of uh, disputable oral history, it's possible that this building never existed. It's just some more. Shots of the galleries. Here's some more models. These, the ones on the left, were refugee cottages that were built after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, and they're actually starter homes. People could, um, they paid a, you know, a small amount of rent, and then after two years, they were they moved them off of the, the site. They, I think they paid two dollars, uh, two dollars a month or something like that in rent, and then after two years, they would move them off the site to some other place in the city. And a handful of them are still in San Francisco. And on the right, you see uh, mobile home, um, and mobile homes were were made of wood framing too, like and. Um, and, and in addition to the history of like the individual examples, if somebody was like really into this stuff, you could go through the exhibition and look at how the pieces were were assembled too. So you know, I don't know how many of you like know the background of wood framing, but originally it was called balloon framing, and then and now we do platform framing, and it's you know for various reasons it's a lot better. But the way that you know, say a floor joist, you know, a piece that holds up the floor and a stud and a wall. Uh, come to you know come together and are connected. That's changed over time, and that's was actually you know done accurately in the models. And here you can kind of see through you know several galleries. Yeah, I think uh, no. So just just kind of continuing through, I think. Um, like Paul was saying, the way that the interiors were organized was basically this continuous thread of models, which allows you to track the history. Uh, and those models uh, are not necessarily canonical projects, but just generically representative projects of particular moments. Uh, and then they were aligned with a set of photographic works, either by, by Christopher Strong or Daniel Shea, so that you could kind of get the communication of these things. Here's some details of some of the models. This is the Cheap Farmhouse by Solon Robinson. Uh, it was a, a project not necessarily or explicitly built as a single thing, but it was actually offered up as a kind of set of instructions, a list of materials uh, that he had published in the American Agriculturalist uh, in the time he was an Indiana businessman. It was a house that was developed in parts uh, so that the family could begin with the kind of uh, initial small home that had the hearth uh, where they could cook. And then as, as they got more money or needed more space, they could continue to kind of advance the home uh, and build new things. It was published with a set of kind of basic plans that kind of looked like this and identified like where you start, then rooms B and C, and then the two wings. Uh, and then basically an itemized list of everything you needed. 72 two by fours at six foot long, 132 two by fours at 12 feet long, 48,000 nails, things like that. Like basically all the parts that you could need. Some, uh, somewhat an early precursor of the Sears house, which then also just sold you those things too. Uh, whereas as the Robinson house was kind of a description of the parts and then Sears as what their business was also sold you the parts um, for the kit home. Here's a detail of the refugee housing from the San Francisco earthquake. Uh, what these 
do as you're kind of walking through uh, the exhibition is to kind of highlight both the technical history, as Paul mentioned, where you can see the early models constructed as uh, balloon frame projects, the later models as platform frame projects, but it also allows you to see the kind of typological breadth uh, that wood framing had within the kind of American cultural landscape, uh, that it was used as a kind of um, domestic structure, but an emergency structure as well, a kind of functional structure that you, you know, see with the warehouse, uh, a, a kind of menacing structure that you see with the, the blockhouse, the kind of military fortress, um, a kind of optimistic, utopic structure that you can see with the, the kind of uh, weird geodesic dome, which was built by hippies who didn't fully understand geodesic dome theory, but kind of got it. Uh, and used a set of parts uh, that also just included scrap materials for sheathing. So I think like the range of like formal domesticity to kind of informal refugee housing to kind of formalized uh, structures of violence to these kind of utopic spaces uh, gives you the full range and then you kind of end with the one that is, is kind of an, an, a ghost uh, in the sense and might or might not ever have existed in a sense you know, our students were able to kind of locate where it existed. Uh, and then we even included as the bridge uh, a small doghouse built at the same scale as every other model. This is Spike's doghouse. Uh, this is Spike. So Spike is a famous cartoon character uh, from the Tom and Jerry cartoons. He is continually harassed uh, by the cat and mouse. Uh, it actually, when Spike is in there, it's the only motivation that Tom and Jerry ever had to kind of be friends. Uh, the rest of the time, Tom and Jerry were always fighting. Uh, but this was Spike's house, and it was his kind of place of peace uh, and where, where he had, and we kind of have this, and we uh, were able to actually find a set of blueprints uh, for the house, so the model was constructed accurately to the, to the original intention. Um, why does the, there's human hands, not dog paws on this he slide. Had, he had weird, like, <laughs> hand paws. Yeah. Hand paws. Um, but it's in here, in a way, because I think one of the things that fascinated us early on about American framing as a type, uh, for different reasons, uh, is the kind of ubiquity of it, where it's so common and prevalent that it goes unnoticed, it's kind of unthought of, it's certainly not considered special in any way, there's nothing rarefied about it, uh, it's rather dumb, it doesn't require an enormous amount of skill to begin entry-level work uh, in it, so you know, you can, you can make your own doghouses, and I think what is wonderful about that level of ubiquity is it's when something develops a kind of non-specialized identity that allows it to start to become subsumed in the rest of culture, and in our sense, American culture, where framing started to take place, uh, take the place of a kind of narrative role in, in other creative works, whether it's cartoons, whether it is the tract housing that Elliot uh, and his friends ride their BMX bikes to kind of try and get ET away from the feds. Um, when they go through this like development in Southern California, or whether it's the kind of instruments of terror that exists uh, as the tools of construction in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre mythology. I forget this artist. This is. Uh, Give me a second. You also, we also forget. <laughs> but whether it starts to become something that is even just identified by conceptual artists as a way to further explore dimensional structure, kind of humans' relationship with objects, or kind of cartography. Um, these are these kind of uh, thin frames of the artist did, or whether it's used as a kind of like mode of entertainment. This is Jim Duggan, who had the nickname Hacksaw, that was a professional wrestler in the, the late 80s and 90s, and his kind of instrument was just a, a two by four, right? Like it had already, it, it developed a kind of like universality within American culture that you immediately understood is it a kind of working man trope. Right, a kind of like blue collar thing to, to familiarize yourself with. Like unlike steel or unlike concrete or unlike any other form of construction, it was something that was uh, for everyone, right? right? Kind of for anyone and, and for everyone. There are these kind of artistic studies that are just done of forestry principles um, that you can kind of see, it, again, was used in comic books as a way to kind of address structure. 
both in a literal sense, in a kind of graphic design sense. This is Gasoline Alley. This is a strip from 1932, 31, 32. Um, and this is just a framed house in construction, but they're kind of using it split among all the cells or frames of the comic strip as a way to kind of, as these two characters are even understanding the kind of metaphysical idea of an individual identity uh, or, or kind of how, how a personality is framed. Uh, whether it's the kind of study that was done uh, of the, the, you know, kind of gay culture or human figure by Toms of Finland when he came to Southern California and kind of saw logging culture uh, as a kind of expression of, of what year was this from? I don't know, it was volume 10, 16, volume 16. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the exact year of this one, but it was it was this kind of magazine that they, he illustrated the covers for. It was after he came to the U.S., so the '70s or something. I don't know. No, uh, it's used as just kind of props and stage sets for the musical Oklahoma, or kind of understood as a narrative device in Dorothy, you know, or in The Wizard of Oz. She caught Toto by the ear. Uh, but it was, you know, important enough to identify uh, the house, you know, w within there. The house was small for the lumber to build. It had to be carried by wagons. Uh, and, and this is the kind of view looking back uh, from Spike's doghouse to, again, just see, like, these things related to each other. Uh, and these are, the next ones are kind of some examples of the two photographic works or the details. So the first, uh, is by Christopher Strong. Again, he's a photographer within Chicago. He does a lot of documentary work for musicians or artists or corporations or kind of corporate clients or institutions uh, with portraits. And he was kind of tasked with uh, giving us, I guess, a location, a visual location for the construction site to kind of show how feral it is at the time with the kind of temporary bracing where n nothing is really holding itself up until all of it's holding itself up. The kind of irregularity of a seemingly regular system that you have to accommodate difference with wall types, uh, just the kind of notions of the sites during their construction, the suburban development in Southern California with a house in construction next to the houses already completed, rebuilds from the fire, uh, but he also kind of looked at the social aspects of labor uh, in particular senses, the different categories of labor. He spent some time with an Amish uh, pre-engineered wood-framed uh, fabrication facility in Indiana and hung out with them to see their factory, to see the products of their factory. The kind of full scale of construction labor is identified, the kind of like generalized labor, the Amish labor, the kind of more precarious classes of labor uh, that exist in the United States that you know, account for an untold amount, but say 250 to 350,000 undocumented or kind of lightly documented uh, day laborers that work for like $20 a week uh, and build a lot of, a lot of the American landscape. Uh, the kind of life of that, the kind of uh, home builder just doing repairs. Uh, to kind of give you the full spectrum that one might have, and, the, and also a kind of union class of labor. And then Daniel Shea, whose work was more mysterious or kind of mythical and kind of exploring the origin myths of wood framing by kind of looking at the forest that could kind of be everywhere and in fact are everywhere, uh, the kind of wood itself, the kind of details of it, the kind of fauna that exist around it and the kind of denied view that one might get or the tools or the kind of details of construction or the social aspects of labor uh, as it might happen. This is just a kind of full, full elevation um, and I'll let you put it in the garage. Okay. Um, so, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, like when you, when you approach the, the pavilion, the you know the permanent pavilion building is behind the full scale construction that that we added so it's a backdrop to it when you come out of the galleries that relationship is reversed and the and the the backside of the of the structure that we built is a pretty abstract flat wood framed wall against which you see the neoclassical building um, 
by uh, Delano and Aldrich. So it, so it reverses that, and then at the same time, like you know, presents wood framing as something that is more, a little bit, um, you know, less familiar and a little, a, a little bit more abstract. And so. Um, in addition, then there's the second set of furniture. I mentioned the first one was the, were the pieces that were more domestic and kind of were in the, in the structure to make it feel a lot like a house. And then there are a series of four benches that were in the courtyard designed by Anya Jaworska. And uh, they are more like public furniture that you know, is, in, is in something that's more like a, like a plaza or a piazza now with the, with the structure, you know, with the wood structure closing it off. And uh, yeah, people used them a lot, actually. Like, there was, it was a nice place. It was a pretty quiet. Um, it was nice to have somewhere to sit down, because you know, when people visit the Biennale, it's like a ton of walking around and looking at stuff. And so to have some place that was a little bit shady and cool and quiet and had, you know, had a nice place to, to rest for a minute was, uh, I think, appreciated. And each of her benches is detailed a little bit differently. The tops are a little different, like this one in the foreground scalloped, obviously. And the one in the background, if you can see, it has just a very subtle um, you know, kind of like uh, valley in the middle of it. This is the four of them. And, and again, here you can, kind of, you can see how the, 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 that really tall and sheer framed wall it, start, it starts from this side to be the background of the building and even the tree in the courtyard. Questions? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I... oh you no, just, just say, oh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, both we both of us, do. Both of us do. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think we we both maintain our individual uh, practices. Paul's in Denver, mine here, or mine in in Chicago, um, and and through that we've both done either institutional work. Paul's did a dormitory. Um, we've done commercial or retail work. Uh, so, so we we we. Sure. Yeah. Of course. And off and on, we do. You know, like some of the projects we do are like you know just buildings, like kind of kind of straight straight buildings in that way. Um, but then you know we often both of us often either independently or together, will do projects for biennials or projects where we work collaborate with artists to do a proposal of some kind for for a, for an exhibition or for a gallery or you know things like that. So yeah, in. in To go in it. Uh, no, I mean I think one one thing that I, I mean in terms of how we've approached our collaborative work for exhibitions, they've usually been actual scaled things in a sense. I mean, it, architecture exhibitions and biennials I think is has a very young history. Uh, in a sense, the first museum department was the Art Institute of Chicago's Department of Architecture, which is only maybe forty five years of age. Um, you know, art as an exhibition has history dating back much further and therefore is already a kind of more matured and sophisticated Oh yeah, for thing. sure it's doable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, we, we like doing full scale work, you know, and, and for exhibitions in particular. I think it's, you know, we both like, yeah. you know, we've been doing that for, for a while now. I think we both like really believe in that as a way to, to show architecture. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we haven't, so We've done a whole, like Paul was mentioned, a series of projects that are full scale. None of them are a house per se until I guess this one, which is outside, not inside. But you could you could do it inside. No, in fact, there are two follow-ups to this exhibition. One is in, going to be in Prague this summer, and and all the models and uh, photos just went went there. There's another one though that we're just starting to work on in Chicago for uh, Wrightwood and. Um, very like we haven't finalized anything yet for that, but but we 
you know, something full scale will be built inside there. So that would be, I don't know if it'll, it will, probably won't be a house, but it'll be something that you yeah, could walk through. Reference. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I really I enjoyed your talk. It was wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thanks. thanks. You guys want to know anything else? Want to know anything about uh, cartoons or? I thought the mouse was yeah. after the dog. And sometimes they go after the cat. I was wrong about that. So sometimes, so here's like in, in the, the, you know, the, the main episode with Spike, the one where he tries to build his doghouse, what happens is Tom keeps chasing Jerry and somehow Jerry will run through what Spike has started to build without disturbing it. But then when Tom comes through, he has some kind of dis you know, problem and he will destroy what Spike started to build, which then makes Spike mad and then he beats up Tom. So, and this just regrettably happens over and over again so that uh, you know, Spike keeps trying to build his house, it keeps getting destroyed. He takes it out on Tom until eventually, I can't remember what he does, but he does something like, to Tom where Tom can't even get to it and so then he finally finishes his house and is happy. I, I think the mouse and Spike had uh, teamed up at some point in a few episodes but the, but the existence of Spike yeah. was the only thing that ever unified Tom and Jerry in episodes. Made yeah. them like give up their cat and mouse differences I guess to be mad at a different type of animal. I don't know. Yeah. Um, we, we can answer any questions, but if not, we can also say uh, thanks very much. Or even see if any, you just want to see a different image than this one. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks to Brickworks for having us here.